Hello friends, I have some updates and announcements for you, so please listen carefully before moving on in the lecture. If you don't know already, summer semester for John A will be entirely online. If you plan on taking classes at SIU, they are also entirely online. Summer semester for John A is scheduled to begin June 8th, 2020. I know many of you are concerned about course grades. My overriding concern is that students need to be treated fairly and don't need to be penalized at this time. And that is also John A's concern. Um, so faculty, so I will submit um, final grades on Tuesday, March 19th as normal. And then you will be able to see your letter grade and choose to opt for a pass or fail grade online. Um, this opportunity is available starting May 20th through Monday, August 31st, 2020. So I encourage you to sincerely think about a pass fail option if you are worried about your grade in this course, right? Um, I will not see, I don't think that you chose to pass or fail. It will not hurt my feelings if you choose a pass fail grade. I understand that this pandemic has been very, very difficult for everyone. And I understand completely that this is everyone's first pandemic. Um, so you might not be mentally healthy right now, and you know what? Seek help, and that's okay. This is everyone's first pandemic. Um, so when making that choice, I encourage you to reach out to your advisor, that's gonna be Rachel for all of you, and talk about your options, right? So you may not want to take a pass-fail grade um, if you have an A, right? That will help your GPA. You may not wanna take a pass-fail grade um, if you need a certain GPA, for scholarships, for college entrance, for a whole bunch of other things, right? So you're gonna wanna talk to your academic advisor to make the best choice for you. It will not hurt my feelings if you want to take a pass or fail grade, right? You, you need to do what's best for you at this time and at this moment. Uh, a reminder that you can also drop this course at any time. Now they have opened the drop date. So if that is something that you are interested in, uh, please contact me. I will help you go through that or contact Rachel and she can help you go through that as well. Please remember to stay up to date with all of the John A updates and to practice social distancing. In the John A area, there is there are 50 confirmed cases of coronavirus and potentially many more unconfirmed cases. So please continue to shelter in place. Please continue to stay inside unless it is absolutely essential that you leave. That means you're not leaving your house unless you need groceries or if you are an essential worker going to work. Otherwise, you need to stay put. I understand that this is not fun, right? I understand this is not what you thought your senior year would look like and I am sincerely sorry for that. And I know this isn't what you want to do. This isn't what anyone wants to do. but COVID-19 is a serious virus that we don't understand, that we don't have a cure for, that we do not have a vaccine for. So wash your hands with warm water for 20 seconds as often as you can. Stay inside, stay six feet away from people. And when you go outside to do those essential activities like work, if you have to, and grocery shopping, please wear a mask. This will help everyone in the long run. Moving on, we're gonna start our lesson today and we're gonna be talking about people who are deaf and blind. Before we get started on the first half of today's lesson, we're gonna talk about some notes on language. So number one, we are not going to be using the term deaf and dumb. So this is a relic from the medieval English era and this is sort of like the starter of all negative lab labels pinned on deaf and hard of hearing people. The Greek philosopher Aristotle um, decided that people were deaf and dumb because he decided that deaf people were incapable of being taught, of learning, and of reason thinking. To his way of thinking, if a person could not use their voice in the same way as hearing people, then there was no way that person could develop uh, cognitively. Obviously, that is false. Aristotle uh, clearly didn't have it right. Um, but you still might hear this um, around. Also in later years, dumb came to mean silent. This definition still persists because that's how um, hearing people see deaf people. The term is offensive to deaf and hard of hearing people because they're by no means silent at all. 
They use sign language, lip reading, vocalizations, and so on to communicate. Communication is not resolved, reserved for hearing people only, and using one's voice is not the only way to communicate. Also, dumb has a second meaning, stupid. So deaf and hard of hearing people have encountered plenty of people who subscribe to the philosophy that if you can't use your voice well, then you might not be too smart um, and have nothing going for you. Obviously, this is offensive, incorrect, ill-informed, and false. Deaf and hard of hearing people have repeatedly um, proved that they have much to contribute to society at large. Another word we're not going to be using is deaf mute. Um, this is another offensive term from the 18th to 19th century. Uh, mute also means silent and without voice. Again, this label is technically inaccurate since deaf and hard of hearing people generally have functioning vocal cords. The challenge lies um, with the with trying to um, mo modulate your voice because you need to hear your own voice to change it. So you might not be aware of this unless you have been doing a lot of recordings of your own voice or hear your voice on tape. Um, how you, if you are a hearing person, are actually hearing your voice come out of your mouth is different than how it actually sounds to everyone else because you are hearing your own voice inside of your head. Um, I encourage you to try this. It might be shocking. Uh, it's certainly shocking to me, even though I record my voice very often, um, to realize how different it sounds outside of my own head. So if you don't have that ability to hear your voice inside your own head, um, you do, then don't have the ability to correct what you have said or re-pronounce -pronou something like that. Um, but again, the deaf and hard of hearing community use various methods of communication other than using your voice. So they are not mute. True communication occurs when one's message is understood by others and then they can respond in kind. So talking is not the only way to communicate. I'm hearing impaired. So this term is no longer accepted by most people in the community, but it was at one time preferred. To declare oneself or another uh, as deaf or blind, for example, was considered somewhat like bold, uh, rude or impolite. So at the time, it was thought to be better to use the word impaired along with uh, any other disability. We're going to talk about that a little more. So hearing impaired was a well-meaning term that is not accepted or used by many deaf and hard of hearing people. Remember last week we talked extensively about language and how to talk about people. Uh, remembering that everybody with a disability is not a monolith. Um, so specifically, the deaf community prefers that you use the word deaf. Um, or hard of hearing, right? Um, the uh, idea behind it is call it what it is. They are deaf. And we're going to talk about that more in the coming up slides. Uh, and for many people, the words deaf and hard of hearing are just not negative. Um, instead, the term hearing impaired is viewed as negative because it focuses on what people can't do. It establishes the standard is hearing and anything as different as impaired or substandard or hindered or damaged in some way and implies that something is not as it should be or that it should be fixed. To be fair, this is probably not what people intended um, when they use the word hearing impaired, but that is the impact of the world. Again, everybody with a disability is unique. They don't have everything in common. They may use different words or prefer uh, different language. Again, like dealing with any minority community, the goal is to be respectful. Moving on, we're going to talk about a little historical context. A reminder that throughout the course, we go over a little bit of history of minority groups because history is very important to understanding present day context. You might remember this uh, lesson specifically from the 13th documentary or from any of the groups that we've talked about so far this semester. To start out with, in 1817 uh, in America, the first permanent school for deaf children opened in Hartford, Connecticut. At the time, most Americans still lived on farms or in small towns. The scattered population made it difficult to establish schools, especially for deaf children, who were few and far between. Because schools for deaf children had to serve such large areas, most were boarding schools. In these residential settings, a community of deaf people began to form. In the early 1800s, 
Um, some wealthy families in Hartford, Connecticut pulled their resources um, to help found churches and other institutions for the public good. And among those institutions was this school. Um, it was called the Connecticut Asylum for the Education and Instruction of Deaf and Dumb Persons. Again, we don't use that language anymore. That is just the language that they used at the time and was the actual name um, of the school. Uh, again, dumb here referred to individuals who did not speak or who did not speak with understandable speech. Again, that's very ableist. Uh, because of the changing word and the associations, asylums eventually gave way to institution and then to school. So around the same time the school was established, Laurent Clerk arrived in Hartford around 1816. He brought the sign language of Paris, a city with a large deaf community. He taught his visually sophisticated language to students and teachers. Students at the school also brought other sign languages with them from New York City, Philadelphia, and a tiny island off the coast of Massachusetts, Martha's Vineyard. Now, Martha's Vineyard is notable because a disproportionate percentage of the population living there was affected by a hereditary form of deafness. The overall rate of the vineyard deafness peaked in the 19th century, when an estimated 1 in 155 islanders, which far exceeded the rate of deafness in America, affected the population generally. Uh, so this showed up at birth with no other abnormalities, um, what we would consider abnormalities, um, right? So what happened is that the individuals um, in the vineyard um, developed a highly sophisticated form of sign language based on uh, languages that were available in the community at the time. And sign language wasn't um, brought together like someone didn't sit down and figure out sign language. Sign language came in a lot of different forms from a ton of different sources and people. So the mix of everyone's signing came together and created what we now would call American Sign Language. Following the example of this school, um, other states began to establish schools for deaf children. Schools opened in New York in 1818, Pennsylvania in 1820, Kentucky 1823, Ohio 1827, and Virginia 1838. By the 1850, 20 schools had been established. By the turn of the century, more than 50. Most states have residential schools, some more than one. Private and religious schools for deaf students became common in larger cities. On April 8, 1864, a year before the end of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln signed an act of Congress to authorize the Columbia Institution for Deaf and Dumb and Blind to confer degrees. The collegiate division of the institution was named the National Deaf, Deaf Mute College in 1865 and in 1894, Gallant's College, now a university. It remains the only accredited liberal arts university for deaf students in the world. In addition to providing deaf people with the opportunity to attend college, prepare for professional work, and assume leadership roles, the university contributed to building a stronger national deaf community. Before the Civil War, most Southern states provided no formal education for African American deaf students. After the war, during the period known as the Reconstruction, the federal government began to force social changes in the South. In 1868, North Carolina created a, quote, color department, unquote, remembering that we do not use that language anymore, alongside the main state school for deaf students. Other southern states soon followed, creating separate schools or departments. Thousands of young deaf people came to residential schools to live and to study together. A new culture was born, enriched by each passing generation that came to include folklore, poetry, games, and jokes, as well as distinctive rules and etiquette, etiquette and sign naming practices. The language that would be known as American Sign Language in the late 20th century was becoming more standardized. From this common language and common experience arose the American deaf community. Deaf advocates argue that they do not have a disability. They have a different language. The deaf community does not use, quote, hearing impaired, unquote, because it implies that something is wrong, remembering how we talked earlier. They are simply deaf. 
They are simply using a different language. Like with all languages, deaf folks have their own culture. ASL is its own language. It is not just English in hand form. It is its own language. It is not based on English. It is based on how to communicate with a deaf person quickly and provide a lot of detail and information. It has its own grammar, its own syntax, and its own rules. It is a different language. Part of deaf culture is attention to detail. Hearing people can get their news on radio, podcasts, by turning the TV on in the background while you do something else. Um, but deaf people can't do that. They need to be um, given information in a more direct way, right? So being direct, being blunt, asking a lot of questions, that's all part of deaf culture, right? So remembering that they're not just English speakers who can't speak, they are speaking a different language and they therefore have their own culture. With that, we're gonna go over some deaf etiquette for hearing folks. Um, there is always a way to get a deaf person's attention. If you are face to face, uh, you can wave to them. You can tap lightly on their shoulder um, if they are sitting or on a knee. Uh, you can pound firmly on shared surfaces like a table. If you're too far to tap them, they're going to feel the vibrations most likely. You can stop firmly on the floor, a vibration will carry. You can write back and forth if that is necessary. You can type or text communication. Um, so like cell phone, laptop, um, tablet, whiteboard. Uh, if you are not face to face with them, you can call them. Their phone number is probably for a video phone and you'll automatically be connected, right? Uh, you can also leave them a message that does work. Another thing you can do is learn American Sign Language. You can attend a class at your local deaf and hard of hearing service center. You can attend a class at your local community college or university. Attend deaf events to meet and practice your skills. Um, you can volunteer to interact in natural settings with deaf people. You can watch videos online about stories um, in American Sign Language about people who are deaf or stories in general. You can learn facial expression, finger spelling, and body language. I'm saying this again because it's important. You need to understand that deaf culture is different from hearing culture. So understanding the way of getting a deaf person's attention is going to differ from hearing culture. So while pounding on the table or, or touching my shoulder lightly is unacceptable in, in like American hearing culture, it is not unacceptable in deaf culture, right? So a reminder that we are learning etiquette because it is a different culture. Uh, you also need to be careful not to break their attention. Um, when you're, they're in the middle of a conversation, please don't just like walk in the middle between two people. That would be like stopping a conversation between hearing people uh, just to like reach across them. Um, know that you don't have a deaf person's attention if they're not looking at you. If they're not looking at you, stop talking. They're not paying attention. Uh, you need to keep eye contact in conversations. It is rude and abrupt to break eye contact with a deaf person without explaining to them why you are looking away. Uh, remember that as a hearing person, you might have a lot of other cues around you to know why eye contact has been broken, but a deaf person does not. When leaving a room, you need to inform the deaf person while you are leaving and when you will return, right? Again, so the idea that this is just being polite um, and keeping deaf people informed and being inclusive. Also, if you hear something that could indicate danger, please help them, uh, right? So if you hear gunshots, for example, an extreme example, you would want to very quickly tell them what's going on and get them to a safe place, right? Uh, some deaf people can detect environmental sounds, not necessarily at the conversational level, depending on the pitch, tone, and, loud and loudness. Uh, deaf people need to be informed because they do not experience in incidental learning in the same way that hearing people do. Right? Explain to a deaf person, this is very important, what is happening around them and just be very clear and provide a lot of details. Because remember, as a hearing person, you're picking up a lot of information through hearing um, that deaf people just don't get, right? Because they can't hear it. So 
again, like with all of the minority communities we talk about, the most important thing is to be polite and respectful. And if you have a question, ask. And to, you know, just try to be inclusive. We're going to move on to talking about blindness in the second half of this lesson. Um, because I am not in the classroom with you, and this class was not designed to be taught online or to be a straight lecture series, um, I am just combining what should have been two separate days into one lecture um, for you so that you can just watch one lecture and have one question sheet and make your um, workload lighter. Um, I also want to extend enough grace to you and be understanding that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Some of you are working. Um, you might be scared. You might be seeing all these commercials that are like, we're in it together. These are uncertain times, which may not be comforting. Um, so that's why I've combined these lessons. It is for you. It is for us to be able to get through this together. And as a reminder, these questions will be due to the Dropbox next Sunday. All right, before we get too far into the lesson, we need to talk about what I mean when we say blindness. So the term blindness can be defined across a, way, a really, really wide spectrum. A person who is visually impaired may have difficulty performing ordinary tasks, regardless of the use of glasses and contact lenses. Blurred visions, blind spots, or tunnel visions could be some characteristics of vision impaired people. Um, eye diseases like glaucoma, which can cause optic nerve damage, can also cause vision loss. In 2012, the World Health Organization estimated that 285 million visually impaired people in the world and 39 million people are officially blind. In the U.S., the National Federation for the Blind estimates around 6.6 .6 million Americans are currently living with a visual disability. The total number of legally blind students ages 16 and up enrolled in high school in the U.S. is over 60,000. So remember how we just talked about language um, in the in the last lecture and when we talked about deaf people, um, visually impaired is what they use um, because you don't technically, right, you can not be blind but still experience some visual, visual difficulty, um, right? And that might be weird to think about visual difficulty or visual impairment as a disability because so many people around us are visually impaired. For example, I'm visually impaired, right? I wear very, very thick and heavy glasses to be able to see. I'm not allowed to drive my car without these glasses. I'm not allowed to do a lot of things without these glasses by law, legally, and also because I just simply can't see. Um, going, getting up in the middle of the night without my glasses um, is pretty difficult for me. Uh, I will bump into things. I can't do much or get very far without them. But you may not think about them as my glasses as a disability. Right. Um, that's because it is very, very normalized to have glasses. Right. And it's also very it's just very socially acceptable. Right. You might also see glasses as like a sign of intelligence, like, oh, they have their glasses because they read so much and they hurt their eyes that way. Um, that's how you should see all people with disabilities and all disabilities. Right. Like you should just make things so accessible that it just feels normal. Right. Quote unquote that it's just something that's accepted, right? But blindness, being legally blind, is not as accepted as being visually impaired, right? So no one has ever told me, I am sorry, you can't come in here because you have glasses or we don't have facilities for you, but people who are blind have been told that, right? So it's all about differing levels of access, right? So when you talk about the term blindness, we're talking about a huge array of people. We're also talking about very different levels of accessibility. All right, so like with all minority groups that we study, I'm going to give you a very, very brief history from 3000 BC to today. Again, this only highlights um, very important background information and serves to give you context. It is by no means an exhaustive history. We do not, unfortunately, we do not have time for that. Um, and also, it's just important that you know history that is about people with disabilities in general and minority groups that you may not hear about in general, remembering that that information is always valuable. 
So first, around 3000 BC, um, first, this is the first time pharaohs gave the command that blind infants should be left to die. Uh, how they tested those infants? I am unsure. Uh, 500 years later, however, things are getting much better. In 2500 BCE, Egyptians treat eye disease and educate the blind. A blind pharaoh about 700 BC forcefully regains his throne after a foreign invasion. Uh, the blind poet uh, Homer of Greece presumably authors both the Iliad or Iliad, depending on who you talk to, and the Odyssey in the 9th century BC. And the English poet John Milton writes the masterpiece Paradise Lost after becoming blind around 1652. In 1784, the first school for the blind was established in France. Before long, schools for the blind were also established in England and throughout Europe. Blinded in an accident as a boy, Louis Braille, yes, that Braille, um, saw an ex-soldier um, doing night riding, and it inspired the 15-year-old to develop the Braille system in 1824. In 1829, the first res residential school for the blind was established in America. It was the New England Asylum for the Blind. The term asylum, again, used um, for most early schools. Today, the New England Asylum is the Perkins School for the Blind, located in Waterntown, Massachusetts. Um, in 1862, Herman Snellen a Dutch eye doctor invents this chart to test visual acuity, letters or numbers of varying sizes arranged in rows. So you might be familiar with this from the eye doctor. In 1880, Helen Keller was born in Alabama. And in 1887, Anne Sullivan, um, her tutor, Keller's tutor, gives her an understanding of language. And you might remember that her first words were water. In 1931, the Pratt-Smoot Act was passed by Congress. It established the federal program of providing books for the blind. It created what was then known as the Division for the Blind of the Library of Congress, which is now the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Skipping forward to 1973, Congress took its first steps into the arena of civil rights protections for people with disabilities and enacted Title V of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Increasingly, civil rights protections for people with disabilities were placed within the Rehabilitation Framework rather than the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, creed, sex, and national origin. Moving on, in 1997, even though the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, i.e. IDAE, rather, and the Federation's model Royal Bills, were in existence at this time, blind students were still experiencing difficulties in getting Braille instruction in public schools. Quite often, the special education teachers themselves were a large part of the problem since they were not fluent in Braille and thought it too complicated to learn handily. In 2000, the American Foundation for the Blind National Literacy Center was established. In 2010, NBG Geraldton Institute begins the publication of the Journal of Blindness, Innovation, and Research, the world's first professional journal published by and for blind people, parents, and teachers to address the real problems of blindness. In 2013, the World Intellectual Property Organization adopts the Marquesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. I say all of that to basically say that in 2020, people who are blind or who are visually impaired are still fighting for their rights and for accessibilities. So there are some, so remember when we talked about accommodation and accessibility, there is not a lot of accommodations or accessibilities for people who are blind right now. And just like with deaf etiquette, there is blind etiquette. Right, so when you're speaking to a person who is blind, identify yourself, especially when entering a room. Don't say, do you know who this is? That's rude and mean to make them play a guessing game. Just tell them who you are. Do speak directly to the individual. Do not speak through a companion, unless they are hard of hearing. They can speak for themselves. 
do you give specific directions like the desk is five feet to your right as opposed to saying the desk is over there? Do you give a clear word picture when describing things to an individual with vision loss or who is blind? Include details such as color, texture, shapes, and landmarks. Do you touch them on their arm or use their name when addressing them? This lets them know that you are speaking to them and not to someone else in the room. Don't shout when you speak. They can, they often, they can't see, but often they can hear. Don't be afraid to use words like blind or see. Their eyes may not work, but it is still nice to see you. If you see a blind person who seems to be in need of assistance, do introduce yourself and ask the person if they need assistance. Do provide assistance if it is requested. Do respect the wishes of the person who is blind. Don't insist on trying to help or offer assistance if it is declined. Also, don't just walk up to a person who's blind and grab them and tell them, I'll take you somewhere. Uh, that's very rude and upsetting, right? That would be upsetting to you if someone did that. So please don't do that to someone just because they are blind. If a person asks you for directions, please use words like straight ahead, turn left on your right. Don't point and say, go that way or it's over there. If you're asked to guide a blind person, do allow the person you are guiding to hold your arm and follow you as you walk. Do move your guiding arm behind your back when you're approaching a narrow space so the person you are guiding can step behind you and follow in a single file line. Do hesitate briefly at a curve or at the beginning of a flight of stairs. Do tell the person you are guiding whether the stairs go up or down. Do allow the person you are guiding to find the handwriting and locate the edge of the first step before proceeding. Don't grab the person you're guiding by the hand, arm, or shoulder and try to steer them. Don't grab the person's cane or handle of the dog's harness. Do refer to the sighted guide techniques for more information. I'll have that linked down below in case you have any more questions. In general, please don't feed, pet, or distract a guide dog. They are not pets. They are working companions on whom a blind person depends. They are doing their job and working very hard. While they might be very cute, please do not disturb them during this work. Please also remember to treat blind people as people. People with visual disabilities come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses, just like everyone else. Remember that the most important lesson that you can learn from all of these minority groups is to be respectful and to listen, right? Please stay safe out there. Please remember to wash your hands and continue to practice social distancing. Social distancing saves the lives of the more vulnerable. While it might not be fun to sit at home all day long, and you might miss your friends or want to go outside, staying socially distant is actually helping people of all strides. Have a safe week.